We're living in a, a real cotton wool society, cotton wool world. What do you see happening to the people of tomorrow with the lack of resilience? You've got adults acting like children, children acting like babies. You've always got a devolution of, of mankind, if you wish. We live in a very much an excuse-based culture now. Everything is always somebody else's like bollocks. Adults have got to be adults. Adults have got to step up to the mark. Hold yourself responsible as an adult. I look at some of the things that people moan about now and I'm like, you're moaning about that. If you was in my era, you would have crumbled. Life is all about fighting, isn't it? No such thing as being super comfortable. I've been in some dark holes, my brother. Some real dark holes. I refuse to crumble for anyone. Life's unfair, life's shit. You have to fight like tooth and nail to get out of it. You see it all the time. You see people with the worst backgrounds, the worst excuses, the worst things achieve the best because they have that desire to make a change. And obviously, I mean, you talk about the positive mindset, and you know, we're, we're living in a, we're living in a a real cotton wool society, cotton wool world at the moment. Uh, so at the moment, I mean, as implying it's going to change, you know, let, let's hope so. But um, I, I mean, what what do you what do you see happening to the people of tomorrow with the lack of resilience that is, uh, is you know, now getting embedded in people? Adults have got to be adults. Adults have got to step up to the mark. You've got adults acting like children, children acting like babies. And, you know, you've got to, you, you've got to wake up and smell the coffee and hold yourself responsible as an adult. And like I said, when you've got adults acting like kids, kids acting like babies, it's, uh, you know, you've always got a devolution of, of mankind, if you wish. You know, we as adults who are responsible, who, 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 who can stand up, we've got, we've got, you know, we've got to look at our children and we've, we've got to hold ourselves accountable and we've got to do what's right by them, um, no matter what any establishment government or whatever it may be says you know what's best for your for your child do you Stand think we've up been and, and, too and subservient to um to to governments I, i'm not subservient to governments so no, but, but do you think do you think as a as a as a country or as a, as a generation well <sighs> governments uh you know they're just there to keep you in the system right you know if there's no system there's no government if there's no government there's no so the system serves well for for some people but it's certainly not breeding resilient um, and uh, and hardened individuals if not it's, it's weakening mankind but each to their own some people like just to plod through life some people like just to you know be subservient to to an organization or to an individual some people are submissive like that some people like to to break the rules some people that's what I find so fascinating about the world everyone is, is different the moment you try and take those differences away and you try and put everyone in the same box, then that's when life becomes, you know, a bore. That's when you live on autopilot. That's when you live in the void. So uh, I, I, I try not to get involved in all that. I just try and focus on my priorities, which is my family, my work colleagues, my loved ones around me and the people that, that gain inspiration and motivation for myself. I try and do what's best by them. And that gives me plenty of opportunities to 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 work on so um yeah i think at the moment you get too tied up in controlling what you can't control then yeah you, you're gonna find yourself in a bad place you know after nearly four years of doing this podcast i think i've got my favorite quote ever now which is even if you've been diddled as a kid there's yeah. no re there's no reason to be <laughs> yeah, a dickhead yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's true, it's true. It's, it's, but the thing is i think the reason i said I, I, i'm not sort of being flippant about kind of abuse but anything in life there's always a reason mm. why you why you, you're limited and and i think you, you can always become defined by stuff that's happened to you and use it as an excuse as to why you can't achieve you know look at we're living a very much an excuse-based culture now you know everything is always somebody else so it's the government's fault it's covid's fault it's you know your parents fault it's your fault it's body's fault it's always somebody else's fault and now we're told we're now teaching kids that being mediocre, being average is fine, just turning up's fine. That if you're, you know, that each person's a unique little fucking unicorn and they can do what they want to do and everyone can achieve everything and impossible is nothing. It's bollocks. It's absolutely bollocks. Like, life's unfair, life's shit. Good stuff happens to awful people. Amazing stuff happens to great people. You know, not a diversion, you know, the division of talent, ability, success, who your parents are, start in life. It's all unfair. And you and you and you have to fight like tooth and nail to get out of it. And some people can never get out of it. And it's easy for me to say as a white middle class bloke who hasn't really had a lot of problems but the, the mentality still stands you, you see it all the time you see people with the worst backgrounds with the worst excuses the worst things achieve the best because they have that desire to 
to put in and, and make a change and they're not defined by excuses and, and life is all about fighting and, and if you teach kids you know sport isn't competitive you're an idiot if you try to tell people that life's not about a fight you're a fucking moron and you know people you know people say well it's just about fun it's like no it's not nothing in life is is comes without hard work and actually you know i think people have to suffer and there's no such thing as being super comfortable and, and I, I i get quite passionate about it because i see it all the time and everyone's always blaming somebody else and so i think you know we always got that friend who's there's always a reason why life is shit and it's like look babe at the end of the day it's your life it ain't dress rehearsal it ain't you know if you don't want to make a difference then you're going to be born have whatever you do and then you're going to die and you're not going to leave any mark or do anything and it's going to be healthy or you can try to fight like fuck to get out of it you know and I mean, we, we talk nowadays a lot about about mental health and depression, mm. which probably wasn't talked about. Well, certainly wasn't talked about as much back then. But I guess it's also not the kind of topic uh, that you would expect to be Correct. on the tip of the tongue of you know of nine 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 gangsters in a in, yeah. in, a, in, a, in a band from the streets. I mean, it, how how was mental health back then for everybody else? Well, this is so weird because my fiance, my rock, is a mental health nurse. Imagine that. And she's one of the top mental health nurses. And she said something to me the other day, like literally four weeks ago. And um, she went, we was watching a documentary on telly. And she went, you've got, you've got PTSD, you know that. And I said, I agree with you. Because um, So Solid was enough. And obviously not just So Solid, because yeah, it's a big part of my life, but I also had my own life. Things that I've seen at home, things that I went through with family members, things that I went through with friends. And it's caused trauma, you know? In So Solid, I got stabbed in my neck at 20 years old. I've had some real devil people around me. I've been around. Music is a gangster. I always say music is a gangster business and it's a devilistic business. You get all these fake people around you. I always say that knowing the music is your friends, mate. People are only using you for what you can give them at that time. And then dealing with family stress, um, music stress, stress of the streets, getting death threats, Remember, I don't. I, I wasn't born in a rose garden. I wasn't born in Windsor of a well-to-do family. I come from the streets, my brother. Um, so when you're successful, the streets follow you. So naturally, for your mind, at that time, that's why, I, with no disrespect, but I look at some of the things that people moan about now, and I'm like, you're moaning about that. If you was in my era, you would have crumbled. You would have crumbled. The things that I've had to deal with, deal with. Where should we start? Should we start with home life? What I've seen go on between. You know, what my mum and dad. Should I start about So Solid, the trauma within So Solid? I, my own trauma, what I've been through with women and divorces and... I, I, mate, there's boxes. You can go in each corner and I can pick out stress from each corner. But obviously I'll say my mental health wouldn't have been good. But I refused, I refused to crumble for anyone. I ain't crumbling for no one. I ain't, with, with no disrespect, I'm not killing myself for no one. That's down to the big man upstairs. When he decides when I'm meant to go. Um, I'm not going to let society crush me like that. Even though, I'll tell you something right now, Matt, I've been in some dark holes, my bro. Some real dark holes. I've done it all. Been jail. There's nothing I ain't experienced in my life. And have you, have you ever taken any professional help for um, for mental health? Have you, you know, talked to counsellors, psychologists? It's weird when they say, when people say professional help. I had a guy called, um, called The Rass. He's like a raster from Battersea. <laughs> Legend. Legend, man. One of the most positive guys that I, you, you, I can't describe in words between him and my stepfather that's what all I needed they was my guiding light I didn't need to go and sit in a professional room because they were prophets anyway and they're the ones that always used to say to me don't worry about what people think of you just keep going everything you do do it with a good heart as long as your heart's good your karma will always be good it will always work out and they would give me the advice that I needed especially when I was in dark places do you know what I mean and um yeah, that's what I needed. I've sat down, when I presented T4 back in the day, I sat down with a psychologist, same um, same psychologist that used to do like Cat Dealey and Princess Diana. Um, but that was more kind of teaching me how to, if I'm presenting national telly, they're kind of trying to show me that you can't carry the streets onto national TV. You've got to be accessible to people. So when you're on t presenting national telly, you can't be like, oh, I'm cool. Because you're not, you're not just appealing to the people in South London, you're appealing to people like up north from where you're from. Someone in a house in Scumthorpe, someone in a house in Scotland. And it was kind of making me, it was kind of just showing me to be relaxed, sorry, comfortable in my own skin, which I am now. Because I know who I am. I don't need people to certify who I am. I don't need to act hard for you to know who I am. Do you know what I mean? Mm. I, I've, 
it's, it's, it's proven. You know my CV. So t- tell me about the book. Obviously, we we can't uh, we can't finish without the book. Uh, I mean, I, I know we've, we've we've referred to some uh, some of the uh, the chapters and some of the activities uh, you know whilst we've been having this chat. But where where did the um, not so much the idea, but I mean, when, when did you decide to write a book and, and and what was the logic behind it at the time? I think um, you know I started writing the book some sixteen months ago. You know. When I looked at it and was approached by, you know, uh, the agency and other people to write a book, again, it was something that I was like, not interested in, but, you know, what have, what have I got to share? And actually, when my friends and other people sat me down and were like, look, you know, what you've actually done is there's, there's, there's actually a, quite an incredible story there in terms of your upbringing, you know, the football, the military, special forces, now into business, everything's going well in life and and the stories and the learnings that, that could be passed on there. So that was the kind of initial idea and the concept. And look, you know, again, kudos to Anne and Foxy and Ollie and Billy, the guys there that have really stuck their head above the parapet. And for me, they've really like blazed a trail for the rest of the people that do leave the military and want to pursue other careers as well. So, and in terms of writing the books, you know, Anne's had huge success and Foxy, and but they've been quite different in their in their books and their approaches and, and kind of the, their teachings and methodology and everything else. And you know, Anne's a super positive, inspiring individual, and his books lean into that you know, and the confidence side of things. And, and you know, Foxy talks about you know, his battles and struggles that he had with mental health, which has obviously helped a vast amount of people, myself included. And for me, it was like, well, what can I add? What value can I add to people? And it's it's about, you know, when we break everything down, having that sort of self-belief in yourself, but also, you know, um, learning, you know, the title itself, that the hard road will take you home was a mantra, something that was spoken to me atop a, a grassy hill by a, a commander at the time in the Royal Marines. It was something, the speech that he delivered that you, know, you can hear a pin drop on this bottom field. And, you know, he talked about life and, and how difficult things are and how putting yourself through adversity and, and difficult, challenging situations really do help you develop and form as an individual, you know, and, he was sort of saying, look, you're in the right place right now. You've all chosen to be here for the right reasons. You know, this process is hard and it's difficult, but, you know, and as cliched or as it sounds, it, it's for, for, for him to say sort of don't take that easy option. Stop looking for shortcuts. The hard road will fucking take you home. Taking, looking at things and not looking for an easy option. That's where the fucking beauty lies in life. And and he's exactly right. And I've taken that mantra with me through life and everything that I've tried to apply it to everything that I do. And, and business is exactly the same as well. Stop looking for fucking short easy quick wins because you know nine times out of ten they're they're exactly that just a short quick win that doesn't have longevity that has nothing no substance or no meaning and you know i've actually learned quite a lot through the military that that are applicable to life as well so in each chapter you know i try and talk about or give you an example from life from military and from business and there's a story from each one and i attach it to that specific chapter in particular and talk about the things that i've learned you know hopefully that it comes across in the right manner it's uh, with humility and sort of you know my fuck ups my learnings you know what i did what i did right what i did wrong what i learned how i've become better and developed as an individual as well and how ultimately i've i've applied that now into business moving forward but where were you getting your information from back then so an interesting point is i couldn't read and write properly till i was around 14 15 because i suffered from dyslexia so I couldn't read the magazine, so I just used to just look at the pictures. You know, uh, I just used to look at the pictures um, in magazines. And another thing as well is I will go to a gym. Um, I remember going into like Lily Road Fitness Center back then, which is in Fulham. Um, and I will look at the biggest guy in the gym and I'll watch what he's doing and I'll count how many reps he's done. And I will keep watching him and copying what he's doing. So a bit weird, like actually one of my first ever training partner was a guy that used to follow around the gym, watch him train, watch how many sets he's done, watch how many reps he's done, count, and I'll do the same exercise, just mimicking what he's doing. Did you talk to these people as well to kind of ask them for advice or you were just like watching from afar? No, I was literally watching from afar and the guy actually caught me copying his workouts and he actually invited me along to train with him. So that was my first training partner at Lily Road Fitness Center in Fulham. And uh, it's phenomenal because, like, like I said, I couldn't read and write properly, you know, because of my dyslexia, I suffered from dyslexia. Back then, you were just thick, you know. I didn't really know what was wrong with me. You know, I was a very late bloomer. Was that causing you issues at school? It was. It caused me a lot of issues at school because when I was at school, I struggled to understand what the teachers were trying to teach us because of my dyslexia. 
and, and and I just felt like you know they just the teachers didn't really have time for me I felt they'll just push you to the back of the room and put you in another group you know like a lower group the, the guys that can't keep up with the main class you know and we were just referred to as the thick boys and girls and uh, it really broke my heart really when I was at school and I just felt I'll end up being a waste in life really and it's funny actually because you know out of all of the guys that went to that school I went to St Thomas More which was in Sloan Square in Chelsea all of the girls and guys that went to that school I think I was one of the top 10 students that was um, invited back to speak oh, really? to the to the current student like unbelievable like at school I didn't do very well but in life I succeeded because I never gave up when did when did you start to identify the dyslexia as dyslexia and when did you then either get help or did you get help how, how, how have you improved it I did I mean I didn't really know that I didn't know that I suffered from dyslexia funny enough it's funny you asked that question until around 2011 as late as that really late as that uh, and the the reason I found out was I was actually wanting to go for promotion um, with a fire service because I've been in the fire service for um, 23 years now and I wanted to go for promotion and uh, I was told that if you have any neurodiversity issues such as dyslexia you get given longer time so I was like oh wow this is amazing <laughs> I was like I've got to get myself tested because then instead of being given like half an hour to do your written test you get like 45 minutes um, which you know 45 minutes was sufficient enough time for me to kind of work my way through the questions and not rapidly you know try and answer the questions so I got I got tested um, I was told I was dyslexia and uh, I put things in place to help me you know coping mechanism like software such as Dragon Dictate you know things are a lot better now you know with with computers and you know the, 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 the struggle that I have is more with reading and writing you know and I and I put things in place to sit to help me with that you know now I can I can highlight a document and get it read to me I can dictate um you know what i want to say and articulate myself in such a way with softwares out there such as grammarly now you know that i can actually make sure that the grammar is all all right before sending a letter or, or an email to somebody so you know it's it's amazing that how far things have come over the years and one of the things that i didn't allow dyslexia to do was to stop me from progressing in life so because I felt like I was going to be a bum to society, a waste of life. I pushed myself in my physical ability like fitness. And that's one of the reasons where I succeeded at the highest level multiple times over because I was so like, didn't feel that I, I, I succeeded. I wasn't good enough. But what's interesting in what you say, because you, you, you start that sentence or that chat off was from a very negative perspective you know i i thought i was sick i thought i was going to be a bum in life mm. and i guess you know with, with with most people that's almost that's where the conversation ends and they define themselves as that and ultimately it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy and they do become a waste or a bum or you know w w w whatever expression you want to use but you you seem to say both times I thought I was going to be a waste. I thought I was going to be a bum, so I didn't let myself, and I went, I went, went and did this differently. It's so important. I think the thought process that we have, the negative thought pattern. I was so scared of being a nobody in society and being a bum. You know, I pushed extra in other avenues, such as, you know, physicality, training myself to have the most amazing physique that you can ever see. So when I walk into a room. I command that room, not intimidating anybody, but command that room. The ability to do amazing things in my job to make sure that when I'm on the fire ground, my fitness will never let me down. I still push myself today in business because I feel, you know, there's so much more I can offer society as a whole by just telling my story. I just think the kids of today, if you have any disability or neurodiversity, ADHD, dyslexia, you're, you, use it as your superpower because the dyslexia to me now it's not an hindrance i don't look at it like a hindrance if i didn't have dyslexia i wouldn't have pushed as hard in life and other aspects of life like my business like my physicality like my my uh, bodybuilding uh, career 
you know, I wouldn't have pushed as hard. I probably would have been just a relaxed, an average bodybuilder, an average, you know, personal trainer, an average firefighter. But because I have this next, I always have that chip at the back of my head feeling like, well, you got to push harder. 